Writing user interfaces that can be translated accurately traditionally comes at the cost of code verbosity and often requires deep linguistic knowledge of the target language. At Facebook, we came up with a solution that enables our engineers to move fast without breaking things and enables grammatically correct translations. Hi, I'm John Watson. I'm a software engineer on the internationalization team at Facebook. And our goals are to make it fast and easy for our engineers to author their UI, translate their texts, and integrate those translations at scale across all of our apps. So I'd like to tell you how we meet those goals. First, we'll be covering the scale that we support at Facebook and the translations and why those matter. We'll cover the architecture and the flow of our UI text and the translations. And finally, we'll take a deep dive into the API our engineers use to construct their text. So first, why does any of this matter? Facebook itself is available in over 100 languages and dialects. Our translators produce over 2 million translated words every week, an amount equivalent to double the Harry Potter book series. 57% of our users use Facebook in a language other than English, and it's crucial we make their experience just as engaging as the original UI author intended. However, engineers want to move fast. And as we mentioned, this typically comes at the cost of accurate translations. So how do we ensure we translate that text accurately? One crucial step is in lowering the burden it takes to coordinate their translations in their apps. We make it easy for engineers to mark user interface text to be translated by providing them an inline markup text we call FBT. Here's a simple and canonical example of that markup text. And no tech talk is complete without hello world, so here's ours. The engineer simply wraps their text in an FBT tag. That marks it for extraction and translation. You'll notice we have a required attribute for description. And this is to give the translator context for where and how this text appears to the user. This context is crucial for getting accurate translations where intent and semantics carry over. And this inline markup buys us a few noteworthy things outside the scope of accurate translations. Firstly, code is now self-documenting. Rather than source text referencing some opaque identifier, the actual text lives where it's used, giving readers of the source code a better understanding of what that UI represents. Secondly, UI text is now searchable in the code base itself, and that's a few less hops when you're debugging. Thirdly, and most importantly, it gives our engineers more time to solve hard problems, because the task of translation is seamless. Before we get into the details of the more complex API, let's first go over the architecture and how it works at Facebook scale. Let's first start with the flow of the FPT text. First, the engineer authors their text. Next, in an offline build time process, all FPT instances are collected and stored in a data store. Following that, translations are collected and stored in a separate data store where they are associated with the relevant FPT source. Finally, in another build time process, translation dictionaries are generated for runtime lookup or Translated source is generated where FPT runtime calls are inlined with their translation payloads replacing the English payload. Here we can see how the architecture fits together. The FPT framework provides everything outside of translations and storage. Bundled in the framework are tools to extract your UI text, tools to generate translation dictionaries once translations are complete, and the FPT runtime itself. So let's dive into the API to see what this looks like from a UI engineer's perspective. We've already seen the trivial examples, so let's look at interpolation. Interpolation can be used to add dynamic content, or in this case, markup. When extracted, a translator will see a text with the token name button included in the text, and that's represented in the brackets. This token isn't translated, but serves as, instead as an argument or placeholder for the FPT runtime. One of the more common struggles in constructing text in both English and non-English strings is handling plurals. 
So here's our pop quiz number one. What's wrong with this text? This example not only breaks in other languages, but in English itself. We create the string, shared links to one photos will no longer work. And on top of creating that one photos string, languages such as Arabic have five other tenses that are potentially broken if this were to be translated as is. FPT provides the FPT plural construct to make writing correct English grammar easier and to enable translations to multiplex into all the variations as determined by the translator. You'll notice that the author provides the singular case as a required child, this photo, and an optional many attribute where we provided these photos in this example. The complete plural and singular sentences are both extracted in full for translation. And here's an example of what our FPT runtime call looks like where the translated payload is inlined into the call. Here in our example, it's Spanish. And we'll pick the correct text at runtime, which is keyed off of the variable numPhotos in this example. Looking at a more complicated example, we can see how we can combine multiple instances of FPT plural to create a cohesive text that maintains grammatical correctness. Here, we're constructing two full sentences. A plural sentence, like shared links to these 10 photos will no longer work, and shared links to this photo will no longer work. You'll notice that in the second example, in the second FPT plural instance, we're using the show count attribute. And this can be a value of no, yes, or if many. Here we're using if many, which means the token only appears in the plural case. You'll also notice that even though there are two FPT plural instances, we don't create four separate sentences. We don't create this number photos or these photo. And that's because we use the same variable for the count attribute. Again, we can look at what the runtime payload looks like, in this case, Russian. Because we interpolate the number into the sentence itself, we have more variations because the number shows up. Again, the FPT runtime chooses the correct payload leaf, and based on the locale and number type, determined at runtime, and again, in this example, it's num photos. Here, we're using the parameter name num, and that's where the number is replacing the token. So we saw how the FPT framework handles the multiplexing complexities of plurals. Let's take a look at how it handles gender variations. So here's pop quiz number two. What's wrong with this text? Actually, nothing, and that's because we wrapped it in an FPT. Normally, this text would be broken for a language like Hebrew, where command verbs are actually variated depending on the gender of the viewing user. However, behind the scenes, a translator can vary a sentence based on the viewing user's gender, and then we mark that text with a hidden key. And then at, F at the runtime, the FPT knows to access the viewing user's key in the payload runtime table. Interpolated tokens can also variate on gender. And we have a special construct that functions just like FPT param, but where gender is required, and this is an FPT name. Here we see that the text is extracted just like FPT param, but where the name token is defaulted and the gender is provided. And again, the translator can vary the value that the translation has depending on the gender of that token, and will access that payload correctly at runtime. Another gender construct we have is FPT pronoun which offers a convenient way to generate text that would otherwise be tedious when dealing with gender multiplexing. The author can decide between four different types. Here we're using possessive. And when past the gender at runtime, the correct branch is selected from the runtime table. In this example, we're generating three sentences that can be translated. This is her photo, this is his photo, and this is their photo. Pronouns can be one of four types, and depending on the type, we can generate three to four texts based on the gender of the pronoun. Object, possessive, reflexive, and subject. Finally, we also provide a way to enumerate your strings. Enumerations provide a way to construct identical sentences where only a select portion of the sentence changes. In this example, we're creating four separate strings with the call to action of purchasing a car, house, boat, or houseboat no car, house, or car boat. It's also possible that certain enumerations are so common that it makes sense to share them in other parts of the code base. 
The FPT framework enables this with predefined FPT enums declared in separate files. Here we're generating five different strings of the form name has a link to share, name has a page to share, et cetera. And you should note that these enums are preferable to using interpolation because a sentence like name has a object type to share doesn't translate well because oftentimes the inner strings necessitate changes to the outer strings depending on the grammar case of that locale. So in our first example, we showed how we could include the markup for our button in an FPT param. But the framework actually allows us to inline our markup wrapped in FPT and exist inline in FPT. The code is then transpiled such that the tokens and the descriptions have their text verbatim inserted during extraction. So an example will better explain this. But here we have a link wrapped in an FPT and in that link a span. And this example generates three separate strings because of that markup. We have the outer string, go on an awesome vacation. We have awesome vacation. And finally, we have the innermost string, awesome. You'll notice that the descriptions for these strings are also generated for translators. And they're verbatim with the text that was written. This saves the engineer from having to write a lot of boilerplate, all while giving the translator more context for the precise text they're translating. All right, <laughs> that concludes the end of this very fast talk. Um, this has been open sourced as of February of this year. We have links to the GitHub pages and the docs above. I'm gonna be hosting a Q&A session at the open source booth in developer resources. Um, that's that away. And then right after that, we're having a classroom in classroom two at 4.05. So thanks for listening. And that concludes this talk. Our session is now over. Please exit.